everybody, and thanks for signing up for this session. My name is Martin Jervis, but I'd like to begin by being somebody else. Colin Angle, Chief Executive of iRobot, one of the biggest robotics companies around with a market capitalization of around two and a half billion dollars. And he said, it's taken so long for the robotics industry to move forward because people keep trying to make something that is cool, but difficult to achieve rather than trying to find solutions to actual human problems. Technology can be extremely expensive if you don't focus. So I'm afraid this talk won't be about super cool robots cleaning our houses, taking the kids to school and massaging our backs all at the same time. But I promise it will be about very pragmatic robots which deliver real value. So I'd like to thank you on behalf of QBot for signing up for this session. Looking at the attendees, we've got a really interesting mix. For some of you, I genuinely hope you'll be amazed by what's going on today but others will know all about that and hopefully be excited by a peek into the future. But for all of you, this will be actionable. My objective is that you all go away understanding that arguably the construction industry has the potential to gain more from developments in robotics and artificial intelligence than any other sector. I'll ask you to decide whether you want to take a leading position to reap the benefits or wait for this to go mainstream, or maybe you're a laggard. Mainstream and laggard is fine, most people in construction are. But if you're an early adopter, this will very likely be very actionable for you. Before I get straight onto it, a sentence or two about Qbot. Qbot was founded in 2012 with the goal of using robotics and artificial intelligence to transform the construction industry. Qbot's solutions enable the delivery of innovative new services for the inspection, maintenance and upgrade of buildings which empower workers improve safety, are cost-effective and efficient. So today's topic is right up our street. I'll show you some robots, of course I will. I'll talk about robots in the built environment and why it's such an opportunity. But this is tough and I'll explain why. I'll describe the current state of play. I'll talk a little bit about where Qbot fits in and share our journey, including what we've learned, including our mistakes and how we see the future developing and then how we'd like to learn more and do more in the future. Construction is a $10 trillion industry, which today relies on manual, labor-intensive processes with falling productivity, which is slow to adapt to new technologies. Qbot and others are revolutionizing the industry by connecting the built environment with robotics and artificial intelligence to rethink processes that have remained unchanged for, in some cases, hundreds of years. The construction industry is ripe for disruption and modernization. Unpacking that in the UK, change is being driven by a number of challenges. Skill shortage. The construction industry generated over a hundred billion pounds in the UK, six and a half percent of the UK's total output, similar to the levels in the US. And it employs more than two million people. However, there is still a critical skill shortage of qualified workers, an aging workforce and a lack of new recruits. Two thirds of surveying firms have already been forced to turn down work due to a lack of staff and over 36,000 new workers a year are needed. And that's why Qbot turns traditional difficult tasks into high tech, safe and less physically demanding processes, creating rewarding career paths for workers. The need to repair and upgrade existing buildings is crucial. 80% of buildings that will exist in 2050 have already been built. Therefore, maintaining and upgrading the building stock is a key challenge, yet there's very little useful information to inform decision making. And maintenance is often reactive, laborious and difficult. So Qbot surveying technologies allow property owners to efficiently gather data on their buildings to support the decision making and maintenance process. A failure to adopt digital tools and processes has also been a problem. One reason there's a lack of useful information is that many processes rely on paper-based or manual data entry. And those systems are poorly integrated with business processes. The construction industry has the lowest rate of adoption of digital technologies when compared to other global industries. Contractors must digitize or die. Therefore, capturing and sharing information across the industry is a key challenge requiring new tools and processes. Qbot's philosophy is that data should be captured and shared in an efficient way to create customer value. There's a lack of accountability. For construction projects, quality can be difficult to measure and verify. So key metrics driving decisions simply become cost and time. 
on average, 12% of a project's value is lost to rework. So in an industry with low margins, it's critical that quality can be measured and accounted for. Hence, alongside its robotics developments, Cubot felt compelled to develop an installation management system to manage the survey and install process, creating a full audit trail of the tasks done to ensure the customer can trust the work that's been done to the required standard. The need to improve thermal efficiency is paramount. Homes are responsible for around a quarter of our carbon dioxide emissions, and space heating is the largest single energy use in the UK, accounting for over half of the domestic CO2 emissions. Therefore, if the UK and Europe is to meet its commitment to reduce carbon emissions, the thermal efficiency of existing buildings must be improved. Cubot's underfloor installation process reduces heating bills by an average of 70%, £150 pounds a year, saving 30 tonnes of CO2 over its lifetime. Changing expectations of thermal comfort are also a fact of life. In the UK, more than 2.3 million families live in fuel poverty, struggling to adequately heat their homes. The UK has some of the lowest energy prices in Europe, yet the highest bills and the coldest homes. Homeowners now expect increased levels of thermal comfort, and those that can afford to will pay to eliminate cold drafts and surfaces from their homes. And more of them will do this, as more of them realise how cold their house can be, especially during the day and especially during winter. It's quite possible some of you are watching me now, shivering slightly, wondering if this is the time to reach out and turn your heating bills and your heating up. So let's talk about how robots tackle the built environment. The challenges I talked about earlier on are crucial, but it's also important to understand that robots can inspect, maintain and upgrade buildings. And in so doing, each will require different capabilities. This will mean empowering workers, improving employee engagement, increasing diversity. And let's face it, construction is particularly challenged in this area, increasing efficiency, provide more cost-effective solutions, and probably above all, improving safety and improving quality. Crucially for the built environment, robots can work in places where humans certainly should not get to, and in some cases, places where humans just cannot get to. Robots can tackle the accountability issue by providing an unimpeachable source of data, which provides both an audit trail and a complete digital record of what happened. And finally, tackling thermal efficiency and comfort issues, the robot and other technologies can provide both visual and thermal records of what's happened and deliver lasting solutions. And most importantly for the built environment, deliver non-disruptive solutions for those who are living in those homes. We'll talk about some of the obstacles later on, but I thought I'd share an independent view published last summer on the advantages of automation with construction robots. Construction robots can reduce waste, save money, and be better for the environment. They can also help deal with labour shortages in an industry short of 200,000 workers. Building sites in the built environment also are dangerous places and autonomous inspection and autonomous payload delivery robots could help in many different ways to reduce this risk. Now, in some cases, robots can lower costs and may work faster, but this is not always a primary benefit from the use of robotics in construction. In many cases, robots will work alongside skilled operatives, but using 21st century skills. In our case, built on skills developed during adolescence and honed in people's 20s and 30s. Why not? It made sense to use a familiar device where many people would be familiar with the controls after hundreds and hundreds of hours of practice. Yes, that's right. We control the robot using the game console. I would tag on to that a few other benefits mentioned earlier on. Firstly, employee engagement, secondly, diversity, the improvement of quality and accountability. But I'd also add insurability. Being able to see exactly what happened before and afterwards means that robots make a big difference to the ability to insure. Robots leave a digital trail, but I can't emphasize enough that identifying non-disruptive solutions is key. And to a borrow a word from the French, perennité is essential. It's that lasting quality of durability for those solutions. I would tag on a few other benefits mentioned earlier. Firstly, employee engagement, and secondly, diversity. Improvement of quality, accountability, and insurability is essential. The insurers looking at what we provide say they've never seen a better audit trail of what something looked like before and after the work was done. 
Robots leave a digital trail, but I can't emphasize enough that identifying non-disruptive solutions for the built environment is key. And finally, to borrow a word from the French perennité is essential. It's the lasting quality and durability of those solutions. It's vital that today's energy efficiency measures in particular continue to perform in the years to come. It's not acceptable to line the pockets of construction firms by delivering an energy performance that falls well short of the required specifications in the future. The planet needs us to deliver what was designed and robots can be better at doing that. So why is adoption of robotics and constru construction so low? Well, using the same independent source, construction sites are regarded as complex places where really the robots need to be worlds apart from many other environments where they've been used, such as manufacturing. And you may be familiar with robots domestically. They present many variables and call for a great deal of judgment, which makes them enormously challenging for robots. That's the very essence of the building site. The cost is very high and has also kept a lot of innovation dollars out such a crucial factor when you think of the fact it's a low margin sector. Who would invest with wafer thin margins for return? So there are challenges and it's fair to say the technology must still improve and I'll show you some developments and talk about those challenges later. But there's lots and lots of promising innovation to get really excited about. But sometimes it can just be commercially misplaced. We'll talk about that later. And although robots are a big step forward in health and safety, it's quite understandable that autonomous devices will take some getting used to, both in principle and in defining the details of suitable working practice. So, let's meet Betty. Now, all of our robots have names, and you're about to meet Betty, the best looking, probably because she's the shiniest and cleanest of all our robots. And that's mainly because she mostly works in video shoots and producing our collateral. So, in the collateral you're about to see, which is a video, Betty is going to be introduced to you by our head of robots, Dana. So wasn't that fabulous? Now let's take a look at some of the differences between Betty and robots that many of us might be familiar with domestically. Indeed, Father Christmas might have brought you a robot to vacuum clean your home, or maybe a robot to cut your grass in the summer. Now these robots are about the same size as Betty, but they're completely different beasts. Firstly, Betty needs to get into tight spaces and can be broken apart into pieces so that she can do that. But primarily, she has to work in a much more challenging environment and deliver a payload, don't forget. There are materials handling challenges with the chemicals and the way that the chemicals need to be brought to the robots and then delivered to insulate the floor. Betty creates a complete thermal and video recording of her work. 
which typically takes place out of sight, underneath a suspended floor, in the floor void. And underneath the floor, there are all sorts of things lurking. So Betty is enormously powerful. In fact, two of the robots could pull Cubot's three and a half ton truck. Now, floor voids in the UK can be extremely challenging with obstacles to encounter and very small spaces to get into. Look at all the rubble and rubbish. In the Netherlands and in France, the voids are much larger and easier to work with. But there we have also refined the robots to deal with the challenges presented of traveling through water and working on top of loose sand. However, the most important consideration for any robotic development is what I call the SFW consideration. So what? In any use case for technology, and robotics is no exception, there is a commercial use case. And that is what should provide the focus for the development. Now, Betty is no different. And here's why Betty is the most widespread use of all of our technologies so far. Because we know that the fuel bill savings impact of our underfloor insulation is behind only wall insulation, and most houses already have that. Its payback period is as good as loft insulation and 99% of homes in the UK already have that. And the performance increase for the amount of money that you get is better than any other measure in terms of being able to give you the lowest cost for that energy performance improvement. So let's look quickly at why there are so few construction robots in widespread use yet. In the middle of last year, Construction Magazine pointed out but although this field is emerging quickly, most robots are prototypes that have some degree of shortcomings. They don't comply with current building regulations or health and safety requirements. In some cases, those requirements are not well suited to technological innovation. Converting the industry to a mindset that embraces digital design, manufacturer and assembly will need to be dealt with very carefully. And procurement practices and resistance to innovation will continue to hold back investment and development of construction robots. In particular, for example, Cubot's 3D scanning and digital twin technologies, which can be used for survey, are technically and commercially really well advanced, but procurement remains a huge challenge. If we also look at the compliance framework, the emphasis can be on physically inspecting something, which means going to the site, rather than the outcome. For example, we can have a compliance officer log on through our IMS and see every single millimetre of the floor void before and after the work that we've done. Yet in some cases, the compliance officer is compelled by the compliance regime to go to the site where they can see less than 5% of the area from where the work has been done. It's crazy. The laws need to focus on outcomes, not on the technology to get there. In many cases, the same is true of procurement departments. I recall in another life many years ago, a company's head of procurement excluding a supplier from a bid for computers because of the lack of a mouse. The computer had to have a mouse. Hence, Apple did not bid. Hence, that company was one of the last to realise the benefits of an iPad. And I've already mentioned a number of challenges that make the adoption of robotics in construction low. So why else is it hard? Well, for inspection robots, think about the physical environment. Are all the walls they're going to find perfectly square? Or the floors perfectly level? Of course not. Do robots need to operate in hard to access areas? Of course they do. So specialist and cost effective tools need to be developed both to allow the robots to maintain the building and to look after the robots themselves. In the future, thanks to Cubot and many others, contractors will be able to look at a digital twin from their desktop first. But today, you need to get to those very challenging areas of the building, potentially inside the walls or other confined areas where inspection robots are perfect. The upgrading of buildings is really hard because those robots also need to actually deliver a payload, a whole different kettle of fish, which requires different specialised technology, a great deal of power, plus everything needed to support and manage such power safely. And if they're operating in hard to reach areas, Extremely higher levels of reliability is needed for the machines with a huge number of working parts. We're all very accustomed to technology just working, our phones, our computers. 
they never break. They're fabulous, they're reliable, but that's because there are very few moving parts. Robots that move and deliver payload are all about moving parts. And last but by no means least, if a robot is delivering a payload, there are enormous challenges around materials handling. What is that actual payload? Developing the robot and supporting systems for that is crucial, but also training. And for example, materials handling training to use Qbot probably takes three or four times longer than training people in how to actually operate betting. So as I move towards the last few minutes, a little more about Qbot so that we can share our experiences. We began with the objective of simply using a robot to survey and insulate suspended floors. Our mission has since extended it based on the opportunities we found for robots in construction. But that use case in itself addresses a huge existing problem. Floor voids could not be efficiently insulated, so there was a commercial issue. And we were able to deliver an accredited solution verified by the Energy Savings Trust. And Betty was lucky enough last year to win the Queen's Award for Enterprise Innovation. So that's an example, as I've said, of an excellent commercial use case. Our wider mission became then to transform the built environment by becoming a global leader in robotics and AI systems that apply materials in order to construct, maintain and upgrade buildings. We're also being asked to work in new build and also a bit of a diversion uh, with, um, on the basis of the pandemic that we're all subject to and sadly currently, uh, we're working on an autonomous disinfection robot for sanitization. But as I said, that's a completely different story. But I have, as you can see from the gray hair, worked in technology for many years and Qbot without doubt has the most IP of anybody I've actually worked with. We have 23 issued patents and 23 patents pending. There's an enormous amount of innovation that we have already begun to commercialize and much besides that we did not. So as I start to wrap up, I want to share what we have learned. Robotics is a tough space in which to operate. And though the rewards are theoretically large in construction, the lack of appetite for innovation, low margins and hesitancy around innovation continue to be challenges. So finding the right partners to work with is crucial. Artificial intelligence will help the speed of development of robots, especially with more and more open source software being shared. But in terms of a product coming to market, I'm a Jeffrey Moore fan, so I'm going to use his crossing the chasm metaphor and re-emphasize that commercial use cases are vital at the early adopter stage because they will be vital if the innovation is to get to the mainstream stage. So during pilots and early phase projects, data collected and the feedback about the product that is actioned must be targeted on the mainstream buyer, not the early adopter. Otherwise, you end up with two years of development with an early adopter and nothing of interest to the mainstream buyer. And those robots only end up in museums. The other big learning is what Moore calls the whole product approach is required. Hence, in order to get Betty to work under the floor, we also needed to develop an installation management system. And onto that, we added the ability to put online a digital twin. And the digital twin in turn took us to inventing new ways to cost effectively survey and scan buildings, surveying and scanning them in a completely different way. And we needed then to collaborate with people who were developing drones for external surveys. All from needing a whole product approach to getting the underfloor insulation robot, Betty, commercially deployed at scale. For robots that deliver a payload, expertise in materials handling is vital, as I've said before. We also know that innovation and change is challenging for organisation and innovation in many cases presents obstacles that are most easy to overcome in terms of technology. That's not the hard bit. We know how to do that. It's hard, I guess, but it's not the real challenge. Many firms like us can master that. The collaborative connections and culture of finding people who will, not can, who will work collaboratively and transparently is crucial. The change ecosystem is challenging. We need clients who are prepared to be early adopters, who are prepared to innovate, and that means being prepared to fail. Partners who prepare to invest, collaborate and empower those involved in the project. And above all, 
to consider the commercial implications right up front when testing. The same is true of our supply chain as it is for clients. In fact, probably more so because they can be more risk averse because they have a huge commercial benefit in sweating the assets they've currently invested in and are deploying now. I talked earlier about compliance needing to be focused on outcome and not process, but it should also be digital first, and I would argue mobile first in its approach. And never forget to ensure that every stakeholder is at the table when projects are set up, their terms of reference established, and agreeing what it takes to prove the technology is ready for wider deployment. And the recipe for getting that part right would fill a 30 minute presentation on its own. So that's really about it from me and from Qbot. Um, how can we learn more in the future? Well, firstly, by having, by having more laboratory and, and workshop test cases, but secondly, more and better commercial use case prioritization. So we need to work with customers and the supply chain to clearly understand how the many use cases we can see for our technology should be prioritized to deliver value for all stakeholders throughout the supply chain and perhaps also disproportionately benefiting those who are prepared to invest. If you're up for any of that, and in particular helping us with on-site tests for new technology, that's great, please let me know. And finally, I would urge us all to collaborate. Collaboration is tough, but it's key, and it has to focus on the best commercial use cases. The technology bit is much easier than demonstrating proof and pragmatically getting solutions to work in the field, particularly in the context of a construction site. So to that end, if I might advertise in the last moments, very briefly, at Qbot, we're always seeking collaboration opportunities in two areas. For inspection robots, wall robots, and retrofit management, we're open to projects and collaborative partners to work with. For Betty, the underfloor insulation robot, we're simply looking for pilots and programs in new markets and for new clients. There is some fabulously exciting work being done with robots in construction. Will you take a leading position to reap the benefits or will you wait? Now, while you figure that out, I will simply thank you very much and then end by reminding us all that though the construction sector may be way behind on digitization and digital transformation, where there is discontinuity, there is always opportunity, as I hope this demonstrates. Thank you.